Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with a man who probably needs no introduction, but I'll give it to him anyway, and that's Doug Ritter. Doug is celebrated in the knife industry for writing the manual on downed aircraft survival, designing the RSK Mark I, now made by Hogue, but he is most loved, uh, at least by this host, that's for sure, for his tireless work uh, with the organization that he founded, Knife Rights. Because of Doug, I can now do this in the Commonwealth of Virginia and not take a trip to the big house. Uh, many of us have Doug to thank for this. Uh, his, Him and his association have changed automatic knife laws and other antiquated knife laws in many states. I think it's past 38 at this point. We'll talk all about that and the current fight for knife sanity in state legislatures. We'll also talk about the ultimate steel sweepstakes, which is ending shortly, and more. Uh, but first, let's uh, like, let's comment, and please subscribe. Hit the notification bell. Download the show to your favorite podcast app so you can continue listening when you have to log off here. And uh, as always, if you want to help the show, you can do so on Patreon. We have a lot of uh, interview exclusives and uh, other giveaways and all sorts of stuff there. Uh, so go check uh, it out on Patreon. That's the, uh, the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon or the QR code. But really, you can also just go to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Mr. Ritter, welcome back to the show. Doug, how you doing? I'm doing great. Always a pleasure to be here. You know, it's basically been a year. It has. I was looking back, it's hard to believe. Yeah, we've had you on the show. You've been here a couple of times. You were on the birthday bash last August. Yes. That was a uh, that was a blast, of course. Uh, and um, but it's always nice to have you on. Not only because you're just a nice guy and we like talking, but it's always good to check in and find out the kind of progress. Uh, knife rights is making um and uh if you need the quick and dirty knife rights is the organization out there that is fighting for our uh, rights for sane knife rights uh reasonable common sense knife laws and uh, you've changed a lot of laws in a lot of states how many states are you up to at this point so 25 states 39 bills uh passed um not bad since 2010. yeah not bad at all i mean so what does that actually take uh, for, for someone who's listening, who, who doesn't really know uh, what that fight might be like? What, what does it look like to you? So, I mean, legislation is uh, not always easy. Um, we, uh, because we have a dedicated lobbyist, we travel all over the country. We go to the state house. We work with people. Um, sometimes it takes years. Uh, Virginia, for example, uh, where you're celebrating the repeal of your switchblade ban. Um, that was five, six years in the making and two, two bills passed and vetoed by two different governors uh, until everything came together. So part of it is just plugging away at it, which, you know, unfortunately takes a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. And well, we, we okay. have to raise that money. So, Well, how, how do you raise that money? So our big annual, now that you mention it, our, <laughs> hey, our big so. annual fundraiser is is heading towards a conclusion here in two weeks. Uh, we've got our tail end bonus drawing, which has over $30,000 worth of knives, guns, and really cool prizes. And our main drawing, which has almost $100,000 worth of uh, knives, guns, and really cool prizes. Uh, anyone who donates now gets in both drawings. So you get two different chances, drawings to win uh, really cool prizes. And it's winner's choice, which is pretty unique. In other words, uh, if you're drawn, you get to pick your prize from everything that's left. So you get the prize you want, not just 
first prize or 10th prize or whatever it is. And we've got hundreds of prizes. So it's pretty incredible uh, event. Um, it provides about half of our annual funding. So it's really important, uh, especially these days, our costs have gone up stupidly. Mm -hmm. uh, recently paid almost $2,000 to get our lobbyists uh, to a state house uh, because you know we had two days notice and that's an economy class ticket. Mm -hmm. uh, that would have been six or $700 a year ago. So it's really important that we you know, raise as much money as we can. And we try to make the ultimate steal and tail end bonus uh, such an incredible uh, event and have such incredible prizes that people want to do it. And we've got a uh, number of tail end uh, bonus knives available where you can donate, say, $100 and get a really cool SOG knife or $500 and get a really cool uh, cold steel. Uh, it, it, I think it's the best drawing out there, but I might be a little biased. <laughs> well, I mean, it is for, for a knife person, it is by far the best drawing out there because uh, not only do you just kind of enter and get something for sure, like the SOG knife, and, but you also have the opportunity to get really crazy, like beautiful custom knives. At, like, I mean, the, the prizes are, cr are like crazy. In terms of how, um, <laughs> let me let me articulate, in terms of how valuable, I mean, these are a lot of, how do you acquire all of these prize knives? Uh, they are all donated. Um, I beg for them at knife shows and elsewhere. Uh, we've got many of our makers who have donated year after year after year. Uh, we've got knives valued up to uh, $3,500. Uh, we've got over... 30 prizes, over $1,000. Um, it's quite a collection of incredible knives, uh, firearms as well. Um, got a knife course, uh, how to make a knife. You want to mm -hmm. go spend five days learning how to make a knife? Uh, we've got one of our makers who's donated that. So pretty much something for everyone. We've got tactical knives, traditional knives, fixed blades, daggers. I mean, you name it. So... <clears throat> um... In terms of uh, uh, you were talking before about having to spend, you know, the things that people might not think about uh, knife rights, having to spend two grand just to send a lobbyist to a to a state capital um, in a rush. Is that what it looks like? I mean, why, why, what is the I mean, I think it's an emergency. Believe me, it's knife related. But how is it that that you were called upon kind of to 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 act that quickly on a knife law? So, you know I mean? so it is when when you have legislation running, it's not like you've got a knife show that you've got to be at, you know, the day to year ahead of time. Um, when you've got legislation running, uh, if you're lucky, you get three or four days notice. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you get only 24 hours notice. And I or lobbyists have to be at that state house to for a hearing, for an important meeting with a chairman of a committee or, or uh, the speaker of the house or whatever it is. And the reason we have been so successful, the reason that we have 39 bills passed repealing knife bans in 25 states is because we show up and we show up every time. And that's how we get things done. You don't get it by sending emails or video or you show up and you talk to these folks in their offices and that's how we get it done but if you don't show up you don't get it done what do you what do you find the sticking points are um you know i think we can all understand what the commonalities are um most of us grow up in some way or another with a swiss army knife or a pocket knife but but when you're there and you're trying to convince uh, legislators, what, what are the sticking points? So, so you have a couple sticking points. One is inertia. You know, once, once the law is on the books, it's not easy to get it repealed. Um, and that is always a problem. Uh, part of the problem is we're very few people's priority. We're very few legislators' priority. Mm -hmm so that uh, we have to convince people to pay attention to an issue that 
isn't making headlines that doesn't necessarily affect them. Uh, and, and that is a challenge. Uh, now we're lucky in that uh, we are the only Second Amendment organization that gets support from the left. Um, we, most of our bills pass with partisan support, um, very strong bipartisan support. Um, so that's part of our secret, but it's also, you know, it takes time. Uh, it takes time to convince folks to carry a bill. It takes time to convince folks to vote on a bill. Um, and it is the nature of legislators and legislatures to leave things to the last minute. Um, the the legislators legislatures that uh, meet for the entire year have even less of a sense of urgency than those that meet for only 60 days or only meet every other year. Um, so it's always a challenge just to get people to the point where we're important enough to do something about. And sometimes that takes years. It's just take coming back and coming back and finally hitting the right combination of legislators and sponsors and timing. Uh, but if you don't go through that process, if you aren't there every year, if you don't keep up, uh, then it doesn't get done. I mean, New York took nine and a half years, two vetoes, and a trip to the Supreme Court. So it's just one example of how you just have to keep plugging away at this. And that's what we're good at. Apparently, I'm a stubborn SOB. <laughs> Thank God. Uh, so, but do you find that um, in the eyes of some people, guns and knives are conflated or at least grouped together? And um, is there is there any of that? Um, yeah, you know, I mean, okay. there there are certainly legislators that we deal with, um, as well as witnesses that come and testify at hearings, that can only view uh, switchblade or an automatic knife or a dagger or uh, something like that as a weapon, and uh, that's unfortunate. But again, we get back to the fact that because this is criminal justice reform, uh, and it isn't guns. Um, we're so often able to get uh, left-leaning legislators to get on board. And I mean, we, we've had NRA F-rated uh, sponsors for some of our bills. Hmm. Um, these are people who hate guns, but they're good with what we're doing because it's their constituents that get arrested for carrying a pocket knife with no intent to do anything wrong with it except use it to open a box. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, so... This, uh, I think it's it, uh, an exciting thing to hear uh, that you get support, bipartisan support, um, only because, well, for a lot of reasons. So we need that kind of that kind of coming together in a lot of ways. Um, and if it's knives that are doing it, that's wonderful. But really, uh, the thing that excites me is that uh, it just seems like the stigma is lifting and uh, to, a, to a great extent, especially about the automatic knives and um and once you find out that a lot of these laws are either, um, um, you know, uh, rest, the restoration period or the time after, uh, what do they call it? The time after the Civil War when they didn't want uh, black people to be armed yeah. or they're or they're based on James Dean movies from the 50s where they thought, you know, juvenile delinquency was a real issue. And that is part of the mix that helps us get things done. You know, when, when we go in and we talk to the legislature and we bring examples, trainers of automatics and assisted openings and manual opening and fixed blades, and we explain and we let them handle it and they see that, you know, that there's nothing inherently evil with these uh, switch blades. Um, it helps those who might you might normally expect to be opposed to this to come to the realization that this is no big deal. I mean, we've been doing this in 2010, uh, 39 bills. No one's ever tried to say, oh, we made a mistake. We need to reinstate the ban on because it makes it has no effect on crime. I mean, the vast majority of knives used in, in criminal acts uh, are kitchen knives. Not switchblades, not 
Thirks daggers or stilettos, uh, not machetes, not long knives. The mass, vast majority are kitchen knives, which everybody has in their kitchen. Um, and when you explain that to folks, they go, oh, well, that actually makes sense. So a lot of it is just breaking through the the prejudices and bias that is built up because of Hollywood and uh, this this demonization of knives um, that you know hopefully we're moving past. I I I'm, people might be sick of hearing me say this, but I believe that our appreciation for knives, our love for our knives, uh, is in our genetics or in our cultural. Uh, genetics. I don't know what that's. I've, I've heard the term epigenetics. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but I think it's so ingrained in us as a tool of survival, a tool, a tool of um, wonder. I mean, you know that when the first knife, which is one of our very, very first tools, you know, that that was high tech that just like we look at our newest iPhone with a sense of wonder, those earliest knives were looked at with a sense of wonder. And I feel like that's still in all of us. And and I would imagine those legislators who are not so thrilled about guns, they see a knife and it triggers something totally different uh, in them than a gun would. I don't, you know, I don't know that it's that. But when you explain to them that the knives in their kitchen are more dangerous than the knives that we're trying to legalize in terms of, you know, when they've been used for criminal activity, um, it, it makes sense to them. It's like, okay, well, I have a whole drawer full or a knife block full of these knives. And mm -hmm. yeah, I get it now. Um, lot, a lot of what we do is education. And once you get people on board and then you can get the steamroller going and then, you know, uh, we make progress. That's how we do things. I mean, Virginia this year, repealing their switchblade ban. Ohio, we got preemption done after getting rid of their bans, all their knife bans last year and changing their terribly vague laws. laws. Uh, Louisiana, we, you're now allowed to conceal carry a switchblade after a couple of years ago, we got rid of their switchblade ban. Uh, Alabama and Georgia as part of their constitutional carry legislation, got rid of their existing knife bans. Um, you know, it, it, it's all a process. You know, we're working in Pennsylvania still this year. Um, we got out of the, the house at a vote of 202 to one. So, you know, we'll see what happens in the Senate after the summer recess. But that's an indication of getting people on board with the fact that, you know, these aren't evil weapons. There's nothing wrong with them. And I can I can make it I criminal justice reform is really a bipartisan issue. And when you frame it as such, um, you get a lot more support than if it's strictly a two A issue or strictly a I want to sell more knives issue and, and that's going to create jobs. So we use whatever tools we can to persuade legislators to get on board. But, uh, you know, we're, we're doing something right, I think. Yeah. Well, what was the fight like here in Virginia? Uh, maybe it wasn't much of a fight at all, but I do remember a couple of years back, uh, this was all brought up and um, it was it was quashed. It was vetoed by our former governor. Um, when you actually by two of your former governors, two, two of them, bills. McAuliffe uh, and yeah, one was one was a switchblade ban repeal, which is what we got done here. Uh, one was uh, the 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 middle one, if you will. Uh, the last one that got vetoed was a ban that simply allowed for uh, companies in Virginia to manufacture, sell, distribute switchblades out of state. Yep. You know, you're home to one of the, to arguably the world's largest knife distributorship in Blue Ridge Knives, and they couldn't legally. All all they wanted to do was right. They didn't want to sell them it. Virginia necessarily, they just wanted to be able to sell them to other all the other places that they're legal. And he vetoed that as well. Again, a bill that had bipartisan support. It was all about jobs in one of the poorest counties in the entire state. So uh, I think it, it's important to recognize that while you now have a Republican governor, um, the Senate is still held by the Democrats. 
So we had to get through both of those, both the Senate and the House, and we did it this year. Everything came together. And again, part of it is just plugging away. Um, you can't give up. You can't, you know, it's, it's inevitable that you're going to lose some and you're going to have some vetoes, but that doesn't stop us from coming back and trying again. And, and you know, the political landscape changes and it doesn't take a big change. You know, in this case, it took the governor, uh, but in other places, it just took a small change in the legislature to enable us to get something done or suddenly someone actually cares about getting it done. It's it's a lot about, so oftentimes, uh, Ohio is a good example of building relationships over years and years of, of effort to the point where, okay, they want to help you, whether it's me or our lobbyists, mm -hmm. to get it done because, you know, you've been around for long enough that they've become friends, so to speak. Um, we'll use every weapon we've got to get this stuff done. Uh, sometimes it's easy, but but most of the easy states we've done. And <laughs> you know, the, the, the low hanging fruit's been picked. Um, and now it, it's honest. I mean, it's harder. It's just harder. Uh, yeah. And I bet a lot of uh, governments feel like they're, they have so many other big fish to fry. Uh, but you know, to your point, like a lot of things in life, it, it's just about showing up and being there and being regular. And I do know in terms of, uh, um, government, you know, I've worked plenty in, in government hearings and those kind of things. And, you know, so much happens behind the scenes and then the, the hearings can sometimes go like that, or they can go on forever and ever and ever if people get on, you know, a talking jag or something like that. But, uh, yeah, to me, the idea of, uh, of, a, of an entire legislative body talking about knives for a period of time. It's amazing to me because it's just not, uh, you know, not in it's, my experience. Well, I, and, and that's part of what we fight. It's, it's, you know, it's very few people's priorities. Um, so we have to try and make it interesting enough and useful enough that they can look at it and say, okay, this is worth doing. And that's also often why it's not unusual for us to get our bills to get voted on you know, in the last hours of a session amongst a bunch of bills that are of lower priority than the budget or serious criminal law or or the things that really get the headlines. And we'd have to be there to make that happen. You know, you were talking about kitchen knives before in terms of being the dangerous ones and uh uh, we had a funny conversation on one of the live shows once where we were kind of, well, if I were to be stabbed, I'd want it to be. And people would name these extravagant custom knives, you know, obviously uh, something that does not happen. It does happen with these cheesy kitchen knives. And then you look over in and and I do mean cheesy because oftentimes you see pictures of murder weapons and it's the cheapest dollar store knife you could possibly get. Um, and then you look over in England a couple of years ago, they were trying to outlaw having points on even kitchen knives <clears throat> and it really made me that to me that was a really comical uh illustration of how you cannot breed the anger and the murderousness out of people by changing something as ridiculous as doing something as ridiculous as making sure that all kitchen knives are dull on the point like well it's important to recognize that a lot of the laws that we have on the books and uh, it is the nature of politicians that when something happens, they have to do something. And oftentimes what they do is really stupid. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we have been party to defeating some of those efforts, um, just as we've been party to numerous lawsuits, uh, getting rid of bad laws that need to do something mm -hmm. um, really overrides common sense. And, and that's how we end up. I would have nothing to do if common sense was common. That's funny. You say that do something thing. And uh, 
you know, in in those horrible moments of anguish after a school shooting or something like like that. That's what you hear a lot of people just do something, do something. And and I get it because it's such a an emotional um, time. But that is a really emotional reaction. Just doing something, you know, leads to almost always leads to bad. Well, yeah, yeah. Just doing something, you know. Uh, and then, like you said, it takes incredible effort to repeal. You know, it's that common trope. Once your freedoms are are given up, they're so much harder to regain than they would have been just to maintain. You yeah, know. I mean, and again, I wouldn't have anything to do if we didn't have people that reacted like that, whether it was after the Civil War um, or in the fifties with with automatic knives. That all became pure politics, had nothing to do with reality, whether it was uh, racism after the Civil War, the whole mess with the supposed juvenile delinquents and gangs, which were often persons of color in the 1950s. Again, that's one of the reasons that we get so much support from the left. But they, all of the, these laws are you know, politics is motivated by the need to create headlines to get people elected. I mean, that's the nature of the beast. You know, in the old days, it was newspapers. These days, it's Twitter, or that sort of thing. You know, they want headlines and they don't, they don't get headlines for doing nothing or certainly not very friendly ones. It's the nature of the beast. Mm -hmm. So they do stupid stuff. Um, and you know, we've spent the last 12 years on doing stupid stuff. Yeah, those decisions that you make in life uh, under duress or um, it, it, during times of high emotion, um, you know, they can be sketchy decisions. Oftentimes you might find that you haven't made the right decision. You found something informed more by emotion and imagination. And also, if you're a politician, a desire to make other people uh, think you're doing something, you know, doing something, right. anything. And, and, and that's what we fight. But the, the good news is that um, at least in our case, we can go to the legislature, we can present our case, got a good sponsor, work the bills and, and get things done. I mean, when I started knife rights, um, a lot of the reaction that we got from people in the industry was you're never going to repeal a switchblade ban. There's no way to get rid of these laws. It's just the nature of the beast and we we'll deal with it. And there were relatively few people making switchblades back in the day when I started this. Um, now, you know, all these manufacturers who didn't have automatic knives now produce automatic knives because they can sell them. It, mm -hmm a whole lot more states than when we started and it's become much more accepted but yeah nobody i i would not have bet that i would have been as successful as we've been at at doing this honestly um it's been a lot harder than i thought it would be because i think that's the nature of life it's always harder than you think yeah. Um, but it's also incredibly satisfying when we get something done like in Virginia or Ohio, where it makes a huge difference. So for you guys, it makes a difference because, you know, now you can have switch plates. Now you can have automatic knives or gravity knives for that matter. Um, when we did Ohio, uh, one of the one of the best things we did was Ohio had some of the most vague and abused knife laws in the country. And now... Uh, the only way you are criminally liable for having a knife of any kind is if it's actually used to commit a crime. That, that you know, people have gone to jail for carrying the wrong knife. Now that will never happen. In New York, we had over 70,000 people are prosecuted for carrying common pocket knives. Hmm. Um, that doesn't happen anymore. Um but that was nine and a half years of effort. What do you think the next or current knife boogeyman is? You know, for so long it was the automatic knife, and that is now um, 
in many, many, many places legal. I am doing my part to regular uh, regularize it to whatever the term is in the culture i show people at work see now i can carry this it's no big deal oh really cool you know we're we're all doing our thing but what what is the uh boogeyman that's coming next was it I, push daggers I'm, I'm not sure it's a next issue uh automatic knives um continue to be the boogeyman mm -hmm. uh in virtually every state that we work in um and as i said we're you know, we've, we've gotten the low hanging fruit. Now we have places like Virginia that took a long time. You know, we're busy in Pennsylvania, which is one of the states, one of the remaining states that has an absolute ban uh, on, on possession of uh, automatic knives with the exception of curios. Um, it's the, the, the Dirk Staggers, Stilettos, uh, the length limits and stuff like that um are relatively rare and we generally get those cleaned up in the process of taking care of the automatic knives i mean there have been a few exceptions where it's taken longer like texas but generally you know if if we can get over the hump with the automatic knives with switch blades then the rest comes relatively easy i won't say it's easy but you know the, the, the other thing that we focus on is like we did in Ohio this year is preemption because it's all very well and good to get the laws changed at the state level. But if you cross a city line and you go from having a legal knife to an illegal knife, which is still the possibility in Virginia, then that is not fair. It's not, uh, it's not good. It, so, so, some some in some states we've gotten preemption done first and then got rid of knife bans and other the majority of states we've gotten rid of knife bans and then gotten preemption there have been a few states where we've gotten it all you know a complete knife reform package in, in one bill but that's pretty rare you know we have to come back in virginia uh and get preemption done. that's the next step so you don't cross the city yeah. line and <laughs> find yourself okay now i'm a criminal so maybe i should kind of ease up on the celebration and the running around showing off my switchblades uh, making sure i know what city i'm in before i well and, and we have an app for that oh, you know oh, our yes. legal blade app um while it doesn't have well it only has about 40 cities in it the 40 larger cities that have bad knife laws um we have links in the legal blade app and on our website so you can check on the codes in the particular towns and cities you're going to and know whether you're going to have a problem or not and and let's face it you know the vast majority of times you're not going to have a problem because why is the cop going to stop you mm -hmm. but the calls i get are well i had a traffic stop or you know i was drunk or and then everything starts falling apart yeah so it's not a problem until it's a problem and then it's a huge problem and then it could be a huge problem how does the how does it happen that ballet songs, which take a considerable amount of skill, um, how did they get lumped in with switchblades, which take no skill? So that goes back to the original federal definition of in the Federal Switchblade Act, which includes the words inertia. Oh, because they were talking, they weren't talking about ballet songs; they were talking about gravity knives, but. The fact of the matter is that that has morphed into covering ballet songs. Um, now, not everybody agrees. I mean, New York State, uh, automatics are still illegal, but ballet songs have been legal for years because of a court decision that says, nope, these aren't switchblades because of, because of the definition of a switchblade and gravity knife that existed in New York. But yeah that's how it happens it, you come up with a definition nobody when when they passed these in the 50s nobody knew what a ballet song was what's a butterfly knife yeah right and but they didn't like gravity knives they want to make sure the federal switchblade act covered gravity knives so they threw in this inertia component of the definition and all of a sudden we're making ballet songs the they they should call it the the flash and clack 
claws. It's like if it, if it flashes or it makes a clickety clack sound. Oh, no, no, no. That's uh, that sounds like a dangerous knife. Uh, yeah, I'll go for that. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Uh, you know, play stupid games, win stupid prizes, as they say. Uh, so you were at Blade Show this year, and I, I did not see you. I saw a number of uh, knife rights people. But uh, what did you think of the show this year? I thought it was great. I mean, uh, the crowds were good. Uh, we did pretty well at, at, at the booth in terms of donations. Um, you know, a lot more people there than last year, which was the first show after the pandemic. Um, you know, the, the, so, so we did the NRA annual meeting the week prior or the, yeah, the week prior to Blade Show, um, and folks weren't spending money, uh, but at Blade Show, they were spending money. Um, I think knife enthusiasts, um, are still excited about their hobby, if you will. And so, uh, it was a good show for most of the folks I know we picked up, uh, an incredible amount of really cool knives, which are now in our tail end bonus. Um, the, the, you know, Blade Show is expanding. You've got Blade Show West, Blade Show Texas. Um, Blade Show West is moving to Salt Lake City this yeah. year, which uh, is a great city to have it, much better than in California. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. That the the enthusiasm that we see from uh, knife collectors and those is really great, and you know we like some of those folks or a lot of those folks to support what we're doing because you know the reason they can buy a lot of the knives that they can buy is the work that we do, and I can't do it without the funds. It's that simple. I don't like that, but. We have to raise funds in order to pay expenses and do what we do. Uh, I, I think that uh, the enthusiasm between, or, or or maybe the maintained and only ever increasing enthusiasm of the knife buying public. Um, I mean, I saw a huge uptick just anecdotally uh, during the pandemic when people are at home saving money just being home, and some people got. Um, stimulus checks on top of other stuff. And so they were spending money and still saving money at the same time. So I think a lot of people were buying knives. I think that never. Oh, there's no question. Knife sales increased exponentially. It was like Christmas every day. Yeah. And you get hit by inflation. Well, there is a host of really well-made inexpensive knives these days uh, coming out of uh, factories, magical factories in China that are just producing incredibly well-engineered knives for a song uh so really i think knife collectors if they needed a a fix so to speak and they uh you know didn't you know they they had pandemic money but not that uh, chris reeve money well then maybe they're buying a couple of civivis here and there i just feel like it never slowed down and by the time i got to blade show yeah it was a blockbuster people could not wait to get there uh you know this this is uh good for the community this is good for us um when when industry is doing well, um, I, I I'm certainly not complaining because I have a stake in this. You know, I can't I can't do what I do with knife rights if if I didn't have my own knife line that's been doing very well. So, you know, it's it's all good. Um, biggest problem most most knife manufacturers have these days is they can't make enough. Yeah, they probably can't get enough materials. How, how do you account for the lack of enthusiasm? Or I should say the difference in the level of enthusiasm between what you saw at the NRA show and what you saw at Blade show. Why do you think that is? Well, first of all, I think a lot of people generally and the, the folks that uh, went to NRA were very concerned about the dollars. Uh, they're worried about inflation uh there's there's a there's a difference between guns and knives uh the collectors the the enthusiasts that we're talking about the the folks that are watching this um they don't need another knife 
but they'd like another knife. Um, and they're willing to maybe sell one knife, get another knife. They have some some degree of disposable income. The the dollars and cents involved are are not incredibly large. Um, there was nobody at NRA who needed a new firearm and needed a new scope. Um, and it, it just, it's a different crowd. They're enthusiastic about the second amendment, but okay, I've got firearms. I'm buying ammo now. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, you know, our, <laughs> that's one advantage knives have over guns is, is you don't have this, 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 uh, this product that you need to get expendable mm -hmm. product in order to use. Um, that's a huge difference. So I don't know. It, it was a very different crowd. Um, it was, it was not that we didn't see enthusiasm at NRA, but generally speaking, they weren't spending money like they were at Blade Show. And when you consider ammo, that's a whole other, and, and if we're talking about nerds and enthusiasts, and by nerds, I mean people who go way down the rabbit hole on their subject matter of interest, uh, but you have two sides of it. You could have an ammo geek who's just like totally into ammo, um, you know, and yes, I have my firearms. I've, I have my bases covered, no interest in acquiring more of those, but I'm always looking for the best ammo for this or that. I don't know. I'm not much of a shooter, but I would imagine... Uh, there's also a in the in the firearm world, there's a just a broader range of things you can get into in the knife world. It's fixed. Is it folding? And then within those, there are there are many. Um... Oh, I, I think you'd be surprised. There's there's plenty of sub varieties in, in the firearms world. Um, and there's plenty of sub varieties, if you really think about it, in in the knife world. I mean, oh, yeah. plenty. I mean, you've got it's not just fixed or folder. You've got traditional, you've got opening mechanisms, you've got the steel use the, I mean that, you know, there are collectors who only buy stuff with mammoth on it. You right. collectors who only buy Damascus bladed knives. I mean, there are, there, you know, traditional knives, you know, uh, versus contemporary tactical knives versus, I mean, that there, there's, there's, there is an incredible variety. One of the things I love about the knife community, about the industry, if you will, is the incredible variety. Um, if, if you look at a bunch of guns laid out on a table that are all different, you know, they all look the same <laughs> to the average person who isn't an enthusiast. Yeah. But it, you lay out a bunch of different knives on the table and it's pretty obvious that there are some significant differences between them. And more than that, uh, when you start looking closer and you see the craftsmanship or the ingenuity that goes into some locking mechanism or some opening mechanism, um, there is a lot more opportunity for that sort of stuff that is very visible. You know, yeah. someone comes out with a new firearm that's game changing, but it's but it's all internal. Doesn't right. look that much different on <laughs> right. the outside. Right. Um, and and you know, I'm a firearms enthusiast. I'm a knife enthusiast. Uh, but the knives really get me excited, and I think I think you see that when you go to Blade Show. Yeah. See yes. the enthusiasm where for whatever it is if it's tactical knights if it's slip joints if it's modern slip joints versus traditional slip joints um there are all these sub genres that get people excited yeah and, you know from from the perspective of knife rights i don't care as long as you're excited and willing to help us continue to work for freedom for knife owners to carry whatever they want um i i celebrate the fact that there's all this variety that captures the imagination of all these different people. Yeah. And that's, that's actually one of the things, you know, I've been collecting knives ever since I was permitted to as a child. That's one of the things I love most about it. You know, on the wall behind me, I have historical, um, 
uh, examples. I have one on the wall that my grandfather skinned a bear with. It's it's directly behind me. I love historical knives. I love swords. I love big fixed blade knives. I love tiny little folders. I love slip joints. So that's the beauty of this. It's kind of what you were saying before. Uh, um, you know, I sort of boiled it down to fixed or folder, but but naturally below that there's an endless uh, tree with with endless branches coming off. And I have a lot of those branches. And that's the beauty part of being a, a knife collector anyway. If you have a collector's instinct is that you can go down. You can have I have plenty of sub collections. I have a sub collection of Bowie's. I have a sub collection of slip joints. If you ever get bored with any any one area of it, there's plenty of fertile ground over there. Right. And you don't have to buy ammo for it. No, See? exactly. <laughs> yeah. So where does uh, knife rights come down on things like tomahawks and knife adjacent tools? So uh, we have helped get rid of bans on tomahawks and that sort of thing. Um, we are knife focused, given the opportunity, um, which sometimes arises to get rid of bans on whether it's tomahawks or clubs or knuckles. Um, we certainly don't shy away from that. Mm -hmm. Um, but we also deal with, uh, an even greater amount of prejudice, if you will, of bias towards things like knuckles, um, that oftentimes it's a question of, you know, we'll try to repeal an entire statute that includes switchblades, knuckles, other stuff. Um, and in order to get it passed, we need to get rid of all that other stuff just to get the knives passed. And if that's what it takes, that's what we'll do. But sometimes we can get it all done. It just depends, but we are, you know, we're, we're in the knife rights business, not right. the tomahawk or, or knuckles rights business. Yeah. They, they got to um, get their own guy. <laughs> and, and we're happy to bring them along with us when the opportunity arises, thrilled to bring them along with us when the opportunity arises. Um, because, you know, it all boils down to the fact that it's not the inanimate object it's the person using them that's the problem um and anytime we can get rid of a ban on an inanimate inanimate object i'm all for that so when we get the opportunity we will yeah more freedom <clears throat> equals more freedom you mentioned before something about uh cleaning up when you're going state to state and you're working with the actual language of these laws that you that you attempt to in any case clean up the language talking about dirks and daggers and bowies and kind of some of these older like i'm vague about what a dirk is i it's like a naval it's like a naval naval long knife as far as i know but i don't even know what the hell a dirk is some of the language in these things is is sort of antiquated right i mean sure i mean Look how old it is. It's, well, it, I, I it's, guess what I mean is, is leaving it in like a, a trip wire, in other words. Oh, we're going to just leave this Dirk part in here because no one knows so what a I, Dirk is. I, I've been, I'm happy I can tell you that we've never found ourselves in a position where we've had to do that. We've had some situations where we've had to negotiate lengths or something like that, where there's been length limits and over time eventually get rid of those. Um, but w when we go in, the goal is to get rid of all the restrictions on knives. And that's where we start in most cases. Um, sometimes we go in in a difficult state Virginia being an example, Pennsylvania being an example, where, okay, let's do switchblades because, believe it or not, that's the easy one. Um, and then we'll come back and clean up and take care of other stuff or take care of the concealed carry issue or that sort of stuff. Um, it Every state house is different. Every legislature is different. Uh, the politics can change overnight. Um, you know, we can have, we had a bill going in Pennsylvania that I thought we had a really good chance of passing like 
five years ago, six years ago. Um, and then there was a terrible stabbing at a school. And, you know, at that point, nobody's going to touch your bill. Yeah. So, okay, we'll come back because we have no choice. It's the nature of politics. You know, if, if it, it, they, they say you can't be a good salesman unless you can take rejection. Well, you can't be successful at politics unless you can stand the frustration of having your bill killed for something that rationally doesn't make any difference or because, you know, a couple of legislatures are having a pissing match and your bill ends up in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. It's just the nature of the beats. It's incredibly frustrating. Um, but you know, if you want to do this and do it successfully, you're going to be dealing with that sort of thing. You're going to be dealing with vetoes from governors who who shouldn't be vetoing a night uh, by any rational measure. So, you know, it's 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 just it's what we do. It comes with the territory. Yeah, you got to have thick skin to do that kind of work, no doubt. And you also have to have conviction and a love for what you're defending, no doubt about that either. And, um, you know, we're not going to talk much about it uh, because I know these things, they, they just can't keep them in stock over at Knifeworks. Uh, but I'm sorry I got to do this. I want to talk just a minute about your RSK um, series. Uh, these are these are my two current. I had uh, the large one. I very, I'm a great brother. I gave one to my brother. Um, Good guy. But, uh, yeah, he loves it and drives his wife nuts with the flipping of it. Um, but uh, so these knives, I love these knives. Uh, your uh, Ritter survival knife, uh, you're very well known for for the folder, um, which if you don't mind me saying was um, originally uh, you wanted a knife that had a super steel, but a reasonable handle and, and something that you could use for survival. And, uh, People love the the RSK Mark I, formerly known as the Ritter Grip, now made by Hogue so beautifully. These knives help to go fund knife rights. So when people buy these knives, they're putting money in a lot of different pockets. But one of those pockets and important pockets is knife rights. Well, so to be clear, okay, um, the money from the sale of the knives doesn't go directly to knife rights. <clears throat> but I take no salary or no money from knife rights. Mm. I can't spend 95% of my time like I do on knife rights if I don't have some income and that income comes from the knives. So when you buy one of my RSK knives, uh, you're supporting knife rights in that I can't do it otherwise. Yeah, this yeah. Is, this is how I make a living that allows me, if you will, to make money while I sleep make money while i'm doing knife rights stuff right um and you know i'm i'm humbled by the fact that people love the knives that they continue to be successful that the whether it's new handles or 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 new designs that we come up with people eat it up i mean that that is really humbling because if you had told me when we started out down this road in like 2006 that um that i'd be making enough on knives to allow me to do something like knife rights i you know i would not have bet money on that any more than i bet money that we were going to be successful at, at repealing as many laws as we have in knife rights so it's very gratifying that people's reaction to these knives has continued um uh, we, you know, uh, it it's great. Hogue is doing an incredible job, uh, oh, yeah. quality wise and build wise. Um, they're knocking it out of the park for me. It's really become a really super partnership. Uh, I don't There's... know what to say. I mean, I, what I, I hope people continue to buy the knives so that I can continue to do knife rights work. I mean, that's the only way it works. Um, but. Having said that, we, you know, please go to knifewrites.org and click on the ultimate steel because we still, you know, we still have expenses and those knives don't cover that. Right. And, and the knives, uh, you know, that that is a long way around for support. I mean, for immediate 
and the most important support it's to go to the ultimate steel and to donate there because that's immediate cash on hand for knife rights to pay its bills and and do do the work you're doing yeah you know i love the fact that the knives continue to be successful if if anything growing uh success um I love the fact that people love the knives. Um, I just received a, an email from a gentleman in South Africa uh, thanking me for the knife because it had literally saved his life. I mean, wow, that's that's an incredible feeling. Oh, and, man. I, you know, a lot of knife designers have been in that situation. And I mean, it doesn't get much better than that because um, the, the, the motivation to develop the uh, RSK line of knives was to provide a incredible value with all the all the design features that I wanted in in terms of uh, quality steel, quality lock, quality build, at a price you know if not inexpensive, but at a price that someone could spend and afford to spend and use the knife. You know I think it's yeah. great that there are people who collect my knives and you know have every model and color variation that we've ever done that, that's that's incredible that someone does that um but it's also incredible that the vast majority of the knives are brought to be used mm -hmm. and they're used every day and that's what i designed the knives for that was that was the design brief if you will is a knife that people could afford a knife that people that that people would use and appreciate um, that fit well in the hand, that had good steel, that held its edge, you know, and it, and, and it continues. It's it's an evergreen design, if you will. Yeah, and there's one thing you didn't mention, <clears throat> and that is that it has a, it's a good looking knife, and that matters. I don't care what you say, Thank but you. it's a it's a good looking knife with boundless character, and and that will that will keep people coming back. Uh, um, I love that knife. I love your designs. But uh, even more than that, I love knife rights. Let people know how they can get in on the tail end uh, drawing of knife rights. And just remind people what it is in case they're just tuning in. It, the easiest thing is go to knifrights.org. Click at the top of the page is the link to the ultimate steel. Um, we've got, like I say, over $30,000 in the tail end bonus, over almost $100,000 uh, or just over $100,000 in the main drawing. So there's two drawings. If you donate now, you get your opportunity to win in both drawings. Um, and it, if you go to the site and look at the prizes, um, we have some incredible knives. I don't care whether you collect slip joints, whether you collect tactical knives, fixed blades, hunters. I mean, whatever you collect, we have some of. Kitchen knives. I mean, there's something of everything there. Um, and just some incredible uh, knife makers who have been incredibly generous for us. You know, I, I can't do knife rights if we don't raise the money. It's really that simple. And with inflation, you know, the sad fact is it's becoming more expensive. You know, we talked about how expensive travel has become, and that's one of that's one of our very biggest expenses. And right. you know, when the price of a ticket doubles or at least goes up 20, 30, 40 percent. Um, that that hurts. That really hurts. Well, Doug Ritter, thank you so much for coming on the show and thank you for so much. Uh, thank you so much for everything that you do with Knife Rights. It's greatly appreciated. And uh, well, man, I'm sad I missed you this year, but next year I will I'll catch you in person again uh, at Blade Show. But again, sir, thank you so much. It was a pleasure. My pleasure. And everyone go to knifrights.org and help us continue this job that we do for your freedoms. Do you carry multiple knives? Then overthink which one to use when an actual cutting chore pops up? You're a knife junkie of the first order. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, the great and powerful Doug Ritter. Uh, again, go to the Ultimate Steel. Go to kniferights.org. Click on the Ultimate Steel. Check out all the amazing knives you could win or choose as your prize. Pick your prize and donate. Help keep uh, help get the rest of the states, uh, you know, with their automatic knives and uh, <clears throat> and other updated knife laws. Join us again next week on Sunday for another great uh, conversation with a knife luminary. 
Join us on Wednesday for the Wednesday Supplemental and Thursday night for the Thursday Night Knives uh, live stream, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time here on Facebook and Twitch. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.